Doesn't that look like it'd be fun to watch? As long as they didn't take too long between turns, maybe. But literally, they have 3,600 seats, and they do this four shows like uh, on a weekend or in a week. And it's a cool picture, but just to carry it further, we're talking in Romans chapter 12 about how God has shaped each one of us for a purpose. And so the idea is how do we become effective as an individual, but especially spiritual life is a team sport. How do we become more effective as a church? And so this morning's lesson is an installment in who God's made you to be and trying to discover that, and then what does God want you to do? And so much like this scenario where they're playing it out, if you can say God and Satan are playing chess and the chess board is the place where you live, the place where you work, the place where you go to school, and God has given you specific tasks and responsibilities and abilities so that the kingdom of light can extend out over the kingdom of darkness. And so our little lives that can seem so insignificant and powerless have a huge impact in this larger scheme of what God is doing. So Romans chapter 12 starts with this verse, and we want to go back and review that because the the why is so important before we get to the what. Paul says, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. So he reflects back on the first 11 chapters of Romans and say, God loves you so intensely that you are such in caught in sin that you can't save yourself and that God is the only solution and that Christ died so that we could have life eternal. And he walks through this amazing story of God's goodness to us. And then he says, in view of that, as that gratitude bubbles up in you for all that God has done, what should we do? And last week, Pastor Will talked about that we're not to think more highly of ourselves than we ought to. You know, sometimes when you can say, I have a gift, it's like, I am gifted. I'm God's gift to women. I'm God's gift to men. And it can become all about me. But actually, the fact that you're gifted means it was given to you. It's something that God has invested in you. And so, He talks about offering our bodies as living sacrifices, and each one of us are to make that commitment, but the way that God uses us is somewhat different. So let me read uh, a couple more verses as we walk through this picture that says, any action motivated by a love for God is an expression of worship. Too often, I think we get to doing business as usual in our spiritual lives and as a church, instead of going back to wow, look what God has done. And even the worship songs are to take us to that place of God's giving us freedom in our lives and His goodness to us. And as that bubbles up in you, then you want to, not just on the weekend, but all week long, say, God, how can I pour out my life? And in some ways, it's easier to say, God, I commit my life to you at one point in time. And instead of saying, God, I'm going to give my life to you every day, It's like a husband who said, I will step in front of a bullet to save my wife. Just don't ask me to do dishes. (laughs) And sometimes we're the same way with God, aren't we? It's like, okay, God, I'll give you my life. I just don't want to do anything this week. And instead of saying, if God calls us to give our lives, it means that that is an ongoing process. So let me read a couple more verses here. We're in chapter 12. I'm going to start um, reading down in verse 4. For just as each of us has one body with many members, he's talking about our human physical body, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it's serving, then serve. If it's teaching, then teach. If it's to encourage, then give encouragement. If it's giving, then give generously. If it's to lead, do it diligently. If it's to show mercy, do it cheerfully. Pretty simple idea in this passage. God's given you a spiritual gift. Now you are to discover it and invest it. And I see very clearly here that God didn't create any of us to be ornamental. None of us are to sit on a shelf and look beautiful. We are to be functional. And so we're going to talk about a little bit of what that looks like for you individually. So it starts with just appreciating your gift. Having this clear concept that not only when I received Christ into my life, he gave me the spirit of God within me, but he also gives me specific abilities 
talents, viewpoints. And that is a part of my whole life. And we often use this shape to, to kind of describe to people how God's made you different on purpose. And it starts with your spiritual gift or gifts, which we're going to talk about today. And then often God will touch your heart for a specific need or a specific group of people. And then we each have different abilities. And that might be you're really good at audiovisual, you might be really good with electronics, you might be really good with, with taking care of people. There's all kinds of abilities. And then God gave us our personality. If you've had more than one kid, you know that they're different from the beginning. And that is a gift of God. Some of you wish you could give it back, but it is a gift of God for the personality that He's given you. And then He's given us experiences. And sometimes those are educational or life experiences. Sometimes they are painful experiences. And listen carefully. If you look at how God has made you, then there is nobody on this planet that is exactly like you. And God has uniquely called you to be a part of this extending the kingdom of light out over the kingdom of darkness. And he's asking you to step up and to take your place so that you can be part of the master chess game that God has going on. So he says, first of all, we have different gifts. So you have a gift according to the grace given to each of us. So the fact that it's a grace gift, and I think we need to expand our understanding of the word grace. Grace didn't just happen 2,000 years ago when Jesus gave his life on the cross. It didn't just happen five years ago when you gave your life to Christ and realized what it means to be a follower of Christ. Grace is something that God is giving or wants to give you every single day. It's his love and his power and his perspective in your life that's pouring in like the sunshine. Only God doesn't want you to be a cul-de-sac. He wants you to be a conduit. He wants you to take that grace that God is pouring into you, and he wants you to pour it into other people. And you will do that in specific ways. And the gift that you have shows up in how you see the world, in what needs you see, in where you want to get involved, and particularly in how God uses you to make an impact in other people's lives. Every gift has its own specific abilities, and it has its inabilities. So I'm going to give a number of definitions of some of the gifts that are listed in this passage. And on each one of them, I'll give you a caution, because it's just like the chess pieces. The, the bishops can go all the way they want, as far as they can go diagonally. They can't go one square in front of themselves. A rook can go all the way straight or to the side. They can't move one square diagonally. And each piece has its own specific role and its own specific blank spots, which is why you need all of them working together. So we're going to talk about individual gifts in the picture that all of us need to not only understand our gift and magnify that and operate in it, we also need all the other gifts around us. We need everybody because the body of Christ is gifted. So what are those gifts? And we're going to walk through seven gifts that are listed in this passage. And it's not the only list. And the Bible doesn't do a lot to explain what they mean. So I'm going to try to give you my best definition based on all of the scriptures and my experience with people who have these gifts. And I believe that you at least have one of them. And you may have two or three. So on your outline that I gave you, there's not much room to take notes under the titles of them. You can try to squeeze it all in there. But I've got a big box over here on the right side, which is for you when I'm walking through them, if you think, I think that might be me. Take more notes on that one. And maybe you say a second one. Oh, no, that's even more true. And maybe you'll get to one you're going like, nope, that's not me, which is fine because we're not all gifted in all ways, but we are all gifted in some ways. So I'm going to walk through this list as we walk through these, this passage of Scripture, and I want you to be doing some of that internal thinking about what has God empowered me to do? What is He calling me to do? And out of that sense of wonder, and I'll tell you, there's nothing more awesome than when the grace of God flows through you and you see you made an impact in somebody's life and it makes an eternal difference. There's nothing better than that. So that's what I want for you. So let's look at this list. It says, if your gift is prophesying, and then if your gift is serving, and if it's teaching, and if it's encouraging, if it's giving, if it's to lead, and if it's to show mercy. So he picks out seven gifts, and he says, 
if this is your gift, get off your duff and get doing it, right? This is where you step into it. So the, the key passage is not, here are the gifts and let me explain them to you. It's, if this is your gift, lean in. So we're going to walk through this list, and this is the order that they are in the Scripture. I'm going to do them a little different order just to compare a couple of them with each other, and so don't let that confuse you. So the first gift is the gift of prophecy. And the prophecy gift can be one of the most controversial or the controversial one in this list. And the idea, especially in the Old Testament, is that prophets told the future. And so they were involved in saying what is going to happen and giving cautions. And and actually you see that in the New Testament as well. But the heart of the prophecy gift is not the foretelling about the future, but the foretelling of God's will and God's word. And so this is... uh, definition that comes from 1 Corinthians 14, and he's contrasting it to the gift of tongues, and he says, the one who prophesies speak to people for their strengthening, encouraging, and comfort. It seems that this gift isn't something you sit down and do a lot of study about so that you can say something. God will prompt you in the moment for an individual or for a group, and you will speak out, and here's the definition, sharing words of challenge and strengthening, especially as related to dealing with sin. So, prophets, by their gift, have a very powerful picture of the holiness of God. And they don't want you to talk about mistakes or oops. They want to say, this is sin. And they're as willing to call it out in themselves as they are in other people. But they are looking at the culture around us and seeing the slide of where evil is being called good and good is being called evil. And prophets want to stand up and speak to that need. And uh, as I was explaining that last service my mom, who has a very strong gift of prophecy, is like, amen. Praise you. So it, it's a very important gift. Do we live in a world that is sucked into Romans 12, 1, where it says, don't let the world squeeze you into its mold? There's a lot of that going on. There's a lot of people who call them followers of Jesus that don't really honor the scriptures and say, this is what God's word says. And so prophets stand up and say, hey, Let's get back to what God says. God is holy and his church should be holy. Is that an important gift in the body? Yeah. Is it always a welcome gift? No. It kind of cuts sometimes. It's a bit painful sometimes. But they call it straight. And you can see in the scripture God used many different prophets to call people back to himself. Now I want to use this as an example. People who have a spiritual gift are to exercise and operate in that gift with the other people in the body. But one of the key functions is not for only prophets to be speaking those words of prophecy, but for them to challenge other people in the body. I know that at times when I pray with people, God prompts me and I feel this, his words coming out and I'm speaking to them about what God wants for their life. And you walk away and you say, wow, that was good. I wish I'd said that. Because you realize it's beyond you, that God is working, and there's that moment. And if you think about all of the gifts, are only people with the gift of giving supposed to give? Are only people with the gift of teaching supposed to teach? Are only people with the gift of encouragement supposed to encourage? No, that we are to not only exercise our gifts, we are to champion them so that everybody, so that we are to to flavor the body along that line. So let me give you a couple cautions. Uh, People who have the gift of prophecy, they can be really strong sometimes. And sometimes they forget about that truth in love thing, and they're all about the truth in truth. And so they need to hang out with some mercy people once in a while just to kind of give them that connection and realize that they're speaking to people and the people are in process. And, And yes, what they're saying is true. But they can also, in my observation, they can get very depressed and negative about the world because they see so much sin, and it's such a problem. And it's interesting that in this text, he says, prophesy according to the faith that you have. What? The faith that God is going to work in spite of the mess that we're in. And you know, you don't have to read very far in the Scripture to know the world has always been a mess. And God has always had people who've called us back to what He wants and what's right. So that's the gift of prophecy. The gift of serving. If we use the motif of a physical body, this is the hands. This is the people that out, get out and get stuff done. And there are all kinds of places in the church family where people operate behind the scenes. And we have a team that comes every week to clean. We have a team that comes to fix things. We have a firewood team. 
that went out during the snow and gave people some firewood that was desperately needed and then helped cut some trees so they could get out of their house. And there were some places where people were just operating behind the scenes. So it's willingness to do practical tasks for the purpose of building God's kingdom. So it's not just a worker bee. This is somebody who says, how can I accent what God is doing by what I'm doing? And we have all kinds of volunteer teams in the church family, that, people that work in the office, people that work with audiovisual, people that help set up the children's stuff. So it's a very, very practical gift. Do we need lots of stuff done in the church family? Yeah, so hands are needed, aren't they? It's a very important part of the gift. And often, one of the things is they like to work behind the scenes. And they like to not necessarily be recognized, but to be effective in their serving. What are some of the cautions for the gift of serving? Well, you need to remember that people are more important than tasks. It can get to be about doing the checklist, getting things done, making sure that things are are cleaned up and taken care of and supplied. And our mission is people helping people find and follow Jesus, not getting stuff done so the building is clean and so that the things are set up. And so you have to be careful to keep the spiritual people involved and to keep spiritual depth as the goal. That I'm not, because I'm a server, I don't need to study the Bible, I don't need need to really grow because I'm just a practical worker. But no, you, you need to be as spiritual as anybody in the body. And then a person who has the gift of teaching. It's giving emphasis and explanation to the scriptures in a life-changing way. So people who have the gift of teaching love to study God's word. They love to get in depth and to compare passages with passages. And usually they like to talk about theology and they want to know what the Greek word is behind it. And they're very, very interested in in in-depth study of God's word. It's a very important part of the process. And they love to explain it to other people But they often, and he says, if your gift is teaching, then teach. And that can be done to a children's class. That can be done in a life group. That can be done in all kinds of different ways. But it may surprise you that this is not one of my top gifts. That people who speak publicly don't necessarily have the gift of teaching. It is your gift comes out in speaking publicly. And when I explain what my primary gift is, then you'll see how that maybe is different. Is teaching an important part of the church family? Do we need to be educated in God's word? Yeah, we live in a biblically illiterate culture. People don't know heads or tails from the Bible, which is one of the cautions for a teacher. You have to remember that you may have somebody who's fresh into the church family, and they're going, I don't know what the Old Testament is. I don't know what a testament is. And so teachers sometimes get way over people's heads because they're so excited about the text instead of going, oh, I need to teach people where they are. You also have to be careful that you're not teaching just information, but that you're teaching for transformation. That life change is the point, not just getting a head full of knowledge. The next gift is the gift of encouragement, or some texts call it the gift of exhortation. And it means coming alongside hurting people and lovingly challenging them to take spiritual steps. So the person with the gift of mercy, or excuse me, the gift of encouragement, and the person with the gift of mercy... They're both drawn to people who have problems, people whose lives are broken, people who are struggling. And the person with the gift of encouragement wants to come alongside and say, let me help you and let me love you. But if you have the gift of encouragement, there comes a point where you go, you're doing this again. The reason you're hurting is because you're making poor choices. Let's talk about that. Here's four steps, and this is my top gift. I want to see people grow spiritually, and I I feel the hurt of the body. Sometimes when I stand up here, I know what's going on in your lives, and I want to come alongside and help and heal, but I sometimes want to give you a swift kick to say, the reason you're hurting is because you keep disobeying God, and it keeps getting you off track, and are you, how is it working for you? And so there can be this, you know, they say some people give you a pat on the back, and sometimes it's a little harder and a little lower, and And the person with the encouragement gift, in fact, I was meeting with somebody for a period of time, and they kept kept wanting to come and talk and talk and talk about their problems, but they never really wanted to change. And so I finally, in frustration, said to them, there's two kinds of people. There's people who like to talk about their problems to get sympathy, and there are people who are willing to make changes so they can get rid of their problems. Which one are you? I already had a sneaking suspicion which one they were. But I wanted them to see it and to hear it. 
And so that, that encouragement gift, and an encourager can come along and just say, I want to love you, but they also at some point start saying, what does God want to teach you through this? So what's the danger of the gift of encouragement? You can start pushing too quickly. Sometimes people are really broken up and you start giving them four steps to move out of this difficulty and they're not there yet. Um, sometimes people who have the gift of encouragement have a long tendency to give people God's wisdom, but they give them four steps to take it instead of tying it back to the scriptures. So you come to trust in the wisdom of an individual instead of the wisdom of God's word. So that's a caution for those who have the gift of encouragement. The gift of mercy also says they come alongside hurting people and bringing hope and healing. They're often involved. I was going to say the gift of encouragement is often a counseling gift. This is often people who are involved in our grief ministry, just coming alongside people that are hurting. I want to put my arms around you as a visible demonstration of how much God loves you. And I want to help you walk through this process. I want to help you get through it. And it's just this loving, open, caring, and they can make you feel so cared about. And it's just just like, you know, healing to your soul. And so we have people, do we need people with a gift of mercy in the church family? There's a lot of hurting people, aren't there? And sometimes it's because they need to learn something. Sometimes life just is hard. And so you need somebody to care about you and love you. So what are the cautions? The cautions is sometimes people with a gift of mercy can become enablers. This person's been doing these same foolish things. They're ending up in the same big mess, and you're saying, oh, poor baby again. You need to turn them over to somebody with a gift of prophecy. You need to turn them over to somebody with a gift of encouragement to say, how do we quit doing this? Or what can you learn from this that will keep you out of this same rut that you've become accustomed to? So they can become enablers. The other part is people with a gift of mercy need to have good boundaries. They're so compassionate that they can move towards hurting people to the neglect of their own life or of their family, and they'll go out for hours and hours and sit and listen and sometimes neglect the people that God's put in their immediate circle. So, very important gift, some cautions. And then the gift of giving. The desire and ability to invest resources in a strategic and generous fashion. I find that most people with the gift of giving have something to give. That is, they're often skilled at collecting resources and making that leverage happen. Sometimes it's not. People just give their time and they're just that generous spirit. But the person with the gift of giving wants to give strategically. They don't want to just give because a whole bunch of things flooded their mailbox and they said, oh, look at those poor kids. They don't want to just fill a need. They want to make a strategic deposit that will move the kingdom of God forward. That's one of the things I've noted, of, noted about the people with the gift of giving. So what are some of the cautions for the gift of giving? Ironically, he says, give generously. So one of the cautions is don't be stingy. You can get absorbed in collecting resources, and no ministry is quite strategic enough. So I'll just hang on to it for a little longer. Instead of not only giving generously, remember I said every, every gift is supposed to challenge others? So you're supposed to challenge other people with your giving. Interestingly, a lot of people with the gift of giving will do matching fun gifts. Why? Because I'm going to give this much. If you can match it, that's getting you to participate with me in the giving. Another caution is that you have to realize that the spiritual ministry is not about finances or building or the big things like that. You need to not neglect people's hearts. You're still making disciples. You're still making disciples who make disciples. And then lastly the gift of leadership, influencing organizations to make them more effective and strategic in building the kingdom of God. I used to think that if Christians all got together and loved the Lord and loved each other, everything would go smoothly. I no longer believe that. Christians are as much a mess as anybody else when there's no leadership. And in 2006, there was a very humbling and strategic moment for Family Church. I'd been the lead pastor for 20 years, and I came to a very clear understanding that I'd become the bottleneck at the top and that my limitedness in the area of leadership, it's one of my gifts, but it's not my top gift, was hindering what God was doing at Family Church. And so we made an unorthodox but amazing switch and Pastor Ed is going to come and talk a little bit about the gift of leadership because God moved him in at that time and he became the lead pastor and I became the teaching pastor and God has used that partnership for the last 13 years in some amazing ways and I want to ask you, tell us, your ear thing is way off over here, yeah. All right. 
Tell us, what is the gift of leadership? So what do leaders do? So there's a number of ways you could talk about leadership, but how I would uh, categorize it, there's four things that need to happen. A uh, leader needs to name the problem, needs to vision cast, needs to build a team, and then manage change. So name the problem, that's always popular. Oh yeah. Have a better idea of what the future could be like, then be involved in getting the right people on the bus and the right seats, and then that whole managing change. Right. So explain how that works. Can you give us an example? Yeah, so as we were getting ready to open the campus in South Umqua, it became apparent to me uh, we had done for a number of years just some really great things. Everybody was uh, kind of working together, and then uh, it just became apparent that we were not going to be able to accomplish um, the effectiveness that we needed to unless we came back and uh, um, really... Uh, Got everybody on the same page. I look at it kind of like this. If everybody on the team has a paddle and you're in a boat and you're on a lake uh, and you start paddling, but there's not clear direction, you kind of go in circles, okay? So More splashing than, than paddling. Yeah, and yeah. everybody's getting wet maybe. But um, So that's kind of where we were. And so I named the problem. I said, we have got to, uh, we have got to get more clear on our mission. And so then uh, I vision cast. What would it look like in the next 10 to 20 years if we all began to, uh, you know, began to kind of lay that out, what that vision might be. And then we began to do some, uh, some team building. I collected uh, about uh, 10 people on our team who I thought were the most strategic. And for the last uh, year, we've been talking through, working through uh, a, a, a process of really identifying who we are and where we're going. And out of that, we've got our new mission statement, people helping people find and follow Jesus. We've got the, uh, our new values, and uh, what we were doing was not bad, but what we needed to do, we had some new leaders, and they needed to be able to lead beyond us, uh, beyond, beyond me, and so um, we're excited. We now have everybody got the paddle, kind of rowing the same way, and now we're uh, in the process of managing cha managing change and getting us to, over the next few years, to, to make what we're talking about, putting on paper, actually into actuality. And this was a great lesson for me because the church had the same weaknesses that I did, having been here so long, and it's hard to lead an organization to create strengths where there are weaknesses. And I got to watch Ed come in and spend the time that it takes and the priority to make that happen. So is that only work in organizations, or does God use that gift elsewhere? No, I think you use it in many, many places, but I'll give you a story of my own family. So I can remember uh, my daughter, Melissa, was in fourth grade, and she came home one day with a, uh, a paper that she had wrote in her school, and uh, to my heart-sinking uh, realization, it was about the meanness of her brother. <laughs> and so, um, so I named the problem, and I gathered the family together, and I vision cast it. What would it look like if we raised honor in our home? And as I sat down with the team, I, our family, and, and began to dialogue, I realized that Tim was in junior high, and he was getting, uh, he was bullied at school, and he was coming home, and he was bullying his sister. And as we, over the next few years, began to raise honor, and we all agreed that this was, we didn't have any control of what happened outside this, the walls of the home, but we did have control of what could happen inside the home. And I will say, by the time uh, Tim graduated, and, and as they were uh, in their high school years, the closeness of that relationship was incredible. I'll bet you they say that to their kids someday. <laughs> Thank you for your incredible gift of leadership. Thank you. Thank you. And I'll tell you what the two cautions are for people with a gift of leadership. They're control and power. That I want to make it run my way instead of for the goodness of God and the goodness of the kingdom and the goodness of the family. And I have to say... Ed has operated in such humility over the last 13 years to such that he's doing all the hard work of leading from behind the scenes, and some people that go to our church don't even know what his position is or what he does, and yet he is humbly adding his incredibly important piece, and I always thought it was a good idea. I just never had time to get it worked in. It was just never a priority, and God has used him to make it a priority, and because of that, we've got a whole generation of 30s and 40-year-old leaders that are coming up with a clear vision that is going to last for the next 15 or 20 years, long after Ed and I have hung up our spurs. And it's a huge, important part that God does, and he's done it with humility, and Ed is not a controller. He sometimes lets us talk way too long before he says, let's make a decision. And it's that incredibly important gift 
that has made such a difference. And it's not typical. It's not how churches usually do it. But it was what God led us to do because of our gifting and recognizing that. So we need to believe in the giftingness of the body and how God is going to do that. And then the whole point of this passage is use your gift. It's wonderful to find the name of it. It's good to develop it, know how to get involved. But using your gift is the only way for it to develop. We actually have a great tool for you. It's called the Spiritual Gift Assessment. You can go on the app on your phone. You can go on the website. You can get it in hard copy. And it's 108 questions of what tendencies you have, where you find satisfaction, where God has used you, where you feel like you might have weaknesses. The problem is that unless you've gotten involved in doing something for the Lord, either formally or informally, it's not going to help you much. It's a good place to start. It's a good place to give you some questions to wrestle with. But the more that you've exercised your gift, the more developed it gets. For example, if you have a child and you say, this child has a musical gift, does that mean they can sit down at the piano and play Beethoven's Fourth? No. It means that they have a sense of rhythm and a sense of they can hear the tones, they can mimic the tones, and if they practice and study, they could become a musician, right? I know lots of people that want to learn to play the guitar, they just don't want to practice. And I have news for them, they will never learn how to play the guitar. It doesn't matter how gifted you are, if you don't utilize it, it will never develop. So part of it is getting involved in something. And sometimes it's informal, as Ed was talking about, in your own family, in your life group. Those gifts begin to surface as you step in and say, I want to do what God called me to do. And it will develop even more when you take some kind of a formal position at the church and you say, I want to try this out. Maybe after six months you're going, nope, this is not it. That's okay. That's a good answer. You've taken one off the list and then you begin to learn how to involve yourself. So this is about... Believing that God's called you to something valuable and important and that you want to give your body as a living sacrifice in a very tangible, weekly, regular kind of way. So whatever gifts you've got, God can use them. And of course, then the second part of that is that not only does it develop you individually and you and your own gifting, it also is the only way for the body to grow. That if you have in your physical body, your whole right side that doesn't work, you are deeply disabled. And as the same way in the church family, there are no gifts for sitting on the shelf. There are gifts for getting involved somewhere, doing something, because, and I used to feel a little embarrassed asking people to do that, but I'm asking you to trade what will never last for what will last forever. And to step into the place that you are designed to live And when you sense that God is working through you and you're seeing lives that are changed, that is so exciting. And you know, it was, this was my destiny. This is what I'm called to do. And it's difficult at times. But when you're working where God has gifted you, you know, this is what I'm supposed to be doing. I I want that for you. I want that for each one of you. So I'm going to hand off to the campus in Green and the campus in South County and... Pastor Sky and Pastor Will, take it away. Let me give you just a couple of points that you can add on to that. I encourage you to take that spiritual gift assessment, asking yourself those questions and talking about what does it mean to your spiritual life will help you begin to isolate what God has created you to be. And again, I told you it's on the app, it's on the website, or I can give it to you hard copy if you ask for it. The second part of it is the best way is not to do the assessment. The best way is to do practice, is to get involved somewhere. And we have needs in the greeters. We have needs in children's ministry. We have needs in audiovisual. We have people that come all week long doing all kinds of different things with different skills and different abilities. And I believe that it helps them grow spiritually, and obviously it helps the Church of Jesus Christ move ahead. And ultimately, that's what it means to discover and find what the will of God is, His good and pleasing and perfect will. So let me pray for us, can I? God, thank you for this refreshment of the spiritual gift studies. And I know for some people it may be brand new, and for others it's something that they've heard about for years. But ask God that each one of us would step in and that we would see your hand at work and that you would develop and shape us and that we would get that excitement 
of using what you've called us to be to see lives change and to see the kingdom of light extending over the kingdom of darkness. I pray right now, even by your spirit, that you would call people who've been sitting for too long and that they would say, you're right, I need to get involved and I'm gonna step up and I'm gonna let God do a work in me. God, lead us, help us put people in the right seats on the bus to get the right people involved in different ministries so that they can grow and so that we can grow. In Jesus' name, amen. We are so glad that you have joined us here at the Family Church Service. And we trust that God is using the songs and the message to somehow challenge you and to help you take spiritual steps. If you'd like to be a part of our ongoing ministry, then we believe that giving is a part of what God has given us a responsibility and a privilege that we take a first part of what he's given to us and we, we give it back to him, both as a symbol that he owns everything and we acknowledge that, and also as a symbol of trust that, God, you're going to take care of me. And so there is on the webpage a place where you can give. And if you would like to be a part of what God is doing here and through this video around the world, that we would encourage you to give and trust that God will take care of you and trust that you want to be a part of what God is doing here. Thanks for joining us, and we hope you truly feel like family.